Okay, so Avery, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Super, all right. Well, thank you for the warm introduction, y'all. We're gonna get right on into it. It is a Monday. What a way to start off the week. I'm so um, thrilled that you chose to start it with me. So truly, truly thank you. And this presentation is meant to be uplifting, inspiring, celebratory. I am not in any way dishonest about the times that the people that we're going to talk about today, including Mahalia Jackson, who you see on your screen, lived. However, I don't choose to reduce their life to the moments that they lived in, which would have been the post-Reconstruction era, sometimes um, within slavery and also within Jim Crow. And I chose to lead off with Mrs. Jackson because these people give me life. They uplift my spirit and I hope that they do that for you as well. And I'm not sure. I mean, you see her hand is in the air. She is ready to give it to us. And this is Mahalia Jackson at the March on Washington. She's the only woman to speak at the March on Washington. And she is the one that encouraged Dr. Martin Luther King, my hometown hero, I'm down here in Atlanta, Georgia, um, to tell him about the dream. That was Mahalia Jackson's doing. And what people often don't know is that Mahalia Jackson is one of us. Now, I'm not saying she was a gardener, but I am saying she got some coins. Flowers brought in some money for her. And Mahalia Jackson owned, she was a, an extraordinary entrepreneur, extraordinary businesswoman. She owned a beauty shop and she also owned a florist called Mahalia's House of Flowers. That's such a beautiful name, isn't it? Mahalia's House of Flowers in Chicago, Illinois. And her agreement was if you bought flowers from her House of Flowers, then Mahalia Jackson would sing at your funeral. So I just think, that's an offer nobody can refuse. No one's going to refuse Mahalia Jackson speaking at their funeral. And I just love that floor culture and floristry was a big part of our life. And I love even more that Terry Spate is on this call, just flower woman extraordinaire. So shout out to you, Terry. And I hope that Mahalia inspires you as she inspires me. The next person I want to talk about is a woman named Dora. Oma Atkins Powell Blackburn. Yes, I just gave you five names, her first, her middle, her maiden, her married, and then her next buried name. So Dora Atkins Powell is easier for y'all to remember. This is a woman whose mother, so her mother started Atkins Flower Shop in Indiana, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I consider her a legacy, meaning she didn't just start in this business on her own, her mother started in the business. So a lot of times you'll notice that the people whose voices that we lift are part of um, a lineage of being in the plant industry. Her mother starts this flower shop. She's around a, a senior in high school, freshman in college. She attends Butler University. And shortly after starting the shop within two years, both of her parents pass away. So it is on Dora Atkins Powell to take over the floral business and that she does. She goes to Butler and she majors in botany because she wants to understand the parts of a flower. She wants to understand how it functions. She wants to understand how to keep it alive, how to keep it fresh, which are the best flowers for cutting. And she has a business that lasts for 56 years in Indianapolis, Indiana until she sells it. This woman is a civic leader in her town. She is someone who travels the country and attends conferences so she can better understand flowers and also uh, very much so is a teacher and teaches the people that work in her business what she knows about botany. So even beyond a florist, a true, true botanist. And I think y'all noticed that the title of this was Lift Every Voice. And that is absolutely from the Black National Anthem um, written by Rosamond and James Weldon Johnson. And so Dora Atkins Powell, we lift her voice. Shout out to anybody from the Midwest today in case you're on the call. Another person I wanna talk about is a woman who I just 
from the moment I found out about her, I think about this woman every day as if she's family. And honestly, everyone you see today, I feel as if they're my family and I want them to feel like they're your family too. Y'all are master gardeners, you're plant lovers, you like trees and, and food and vegetables. So please understand that this isn't just black garden history. This is American history. This is garden history to the world. And Mrs. Annie Mae Van Reed, Annie Mae Van Reed, I love giving folks the whole name. I have no idea why, but I do, is a woman who is born in North Carolina and makes her claim to fame in the horticulture industry in Darlington, South Carolina. She starts off there as a teacher and starts growing flowers in her yard. And the town takes notice. Folks start asking for a few flowers and she's generous. She gives them away. She's generous to the community. Then she realizes, well, there's no floral business around here. There's no greenhouses in this area. I might as well start one on my own. And so she shifts from being a teacher to opening up a greenhouse and a five acre nursery in Darlington. This is one of the most successful businesses in South Carolina. She gets so busy, she has to bring plants into her business. Her plants are shipped all up and down the East Coast. One of her uh, customers is the governor of South Carolina at the time, Strom Thurmond, who was a trash human being. We all know this. However, as racist as he was, he knew that if I'm gonna get the best flowers in South Carolina, if not the Southeast, I have to go through Mrs. Annie Mae Van Reed. And also, if you've ever heard me speak, I just cannot let this go because it is it's such a flex, y'all. Look at this woman standing here in her fur coat in South Carolina. I live in Georgia. You don't need no fur coats around here. And not that I'm saying I'm an advocate of fur. What I'm saying is a it is a flex of her wealth. She wasn't just a five-acre nursery and greenhouse owner, this woman owned land in the Carolinas and Virginia. So when we think of someone like a Madam C.J. Walker, a self-made woman of wealth in the um, hair industry, think about Annie Mae Van Reed as that to the flower and greenhouse and nursery industry. That's exactly what she was. And she was also an advocate of women and um, would speak at colleges and encourage women to start their own businesses uh, particularly in flowers. And I just want to show y'all this. I love me some archives. And I think there are a lot of people in this call that love those too. And this is some of her stationery from the Darlington Greenhouse in South Carolina. And I want to thank the Darlington South Carolina History Society for sharing this with me. Um, just beautiful, beautiful. And I love how it says when you say it with flowers, you say it with our flowers. And when I tell y'all she was a woman of wealth, I'm not kidding. So I showed you her fur coat, her scarf, looking like a million bucks. And now she's looking like a trillion bucks, y'all. Look at this 1940s Ford floral delivery van. Can it get any more extraordinary than that? I don't think so. I don't think there's a florist, nursery, greenhouse out there in America today that has a more elite way to transport their plants around. So this is the iconic Annie Mae Van Reed. And also to be noted, at this time, folks, especially Black folks, they weren't going to Home Depot or the local garden centers, like what we have in Atlanta called Pipe Nursery. This is where they were getting their plants from. People like Mrs. Annie Mae Van Reed. This is during Jim Crow. This is during a time where Black people are doing a lot of propagation, a lot of pass along plants. So. I really think we have to acknowledge how impactful, we may never know that he is in terms of her being able to distribute um, not just beautification plants, not just the ornamental plants, but also fruits and vegetables throughout the community. The next person I wanna to talk to you all about, I'm kind of in my, my little flower zone. I think y'all can sell that right now and we'll move on to trees and gardeners and academics uh, throughout the presentation. But this woman um, is, particularly important. This is Mrs. Blanche King Hurston, one of Jacksonville, Florida's finest citizens. Her family, the King family, was a pioneer Black family in Jacksonville. And at one point, Jacksonville, Florida had the highest population of not just Black people, wealthy Black people in the United States. And this is at the turn of the 20th century, the early 1900s. 
Now, Mrs. Blanche King Hurston in the line, the vein of, of Annie Reed is also a black woman that owns a flower shop. And Mrs. Hurston has a flower farm that she has in Jacksonville, Florida. It is a five acre flower farm. And the farm is managed by her father, Ed King, who you see on the left. And he's standing there with a woman named Gerda Meggs, who he was also a gardener for in Jacksonville, the Meggs family. Now, Ed King, um, it wasn't that he was just a gardener. He was an exceptional, an exceptional gardener, landscaper, however you'd like to use the term. And he managed a five acre flower farm for his daughter, Blanche. So I showed y'all how Dora Atkins Powell Blackburn was a legacy. You could say that also about Blanche King Hurston being a legacy, probably learning how to cultivate the soil and have this excitement for plants from her father. Now, Annie Mae Van Reed with her fur, with her 1940s Ford delivery truck, that was a flex. Blanche King Hurston knew how to show off too. Her shop, the Evergreen Floors, was so successful that she had people, that she had to hire people in the community to work for her. And I mean, she would just get so, so busy all the time. She needed this extra help. And she also had her own chauffeur. And that is who you see here. The, that is Blanche King in the white outfit with the beautiful hat on, sitting there posing. And to the right is her godson, Herbert Austin, who served as her part-time chauffeur. So these women were using the land and building wealth and were very, very generous in their communities, creating jobs, supporting the economy, teaching other women how to create these businesses. I don't know how many of y'all read the, um, not the show notes, but maybe the, uh, the little blurb that went out prior to the presentation. And um, I mentioned in there, Blanche King Hurston. She's born into the King family, this established Jacksonville pioneer family. Blanche King Hurston was married to a gentleman named John Hurston, who is the older brother of Zora Neale Hurston, the iconic Harlem Renaissance writer, anthropologist, just a Wonder Woman. I mean, honestly, that's who Zora Neale Hurston is. And Zora Neale Hurston spent her, young, her years as a young woman in high school and her early 20s and throughout life came back and forth and lived with the Hurston family in Jackson. I'm sorry, with the King family, with Blanche King and her brother, John Hurston. So we have to believe and know and understand that just because you can't look it up in a book, this is very true. Zora Neale Hurston would have been one of those people that had to help Blanche. She lived in her household for decades and decades and decades. And this is a woman who had built a floral shop right next to her house and got so busy, she had to build an annex, a two-story annex behind it. So it was torn down in 2014. That's a whole other story for a whole other day. But I just wanted to acknowledge uh, her celebrity status with this being her sister-in-law. Now I want to talk, I talked about uh, Ed King, Blanche King Hurston's father as a gardener. This is another head gardener. This is Mr. Sylvester Owens, who was the chauffeur. I showed you Herbert Austin, who was the chauffeur, chauffeur for Blanche King Hurston. Sylvester Owens was the chauffeur for a gentleman named Chauncey Beadle, the legendary Canadian horticulturist who moved down to North Carolina and established the gardens at Biltmore Estates in Asheville, North Carolina. And for 30 years, I say he's chauffeur, but this is one of many jobs this gentleman has. He is the right-hand man of Chauncey Beadle. And Chauncey Beadle and his crew, his friends, they would ride around the South and be part of this plant exploration crew and really explore native plants, particularly azaleas throughout the Southeast. And it was often surprising when they show up to hotels, um, when Mr. Owens here would show up with them as the driver, and he'd get his room keys and he would have to tell the people, actually, I am a black man. So those are the quarters that I need to stay in. People just absolutely didn't know. And it is to be said, this gentleman was so attentive and acute with his garden skills and with his observations of uh, Mr. Beetle. He's essentially a self-taught horticulturist himself. Not essentially, he's a self-taught horticulturist, so it means he's a horticulturist. 
And at the passing of Chauncey Beadle, Biltmore Estates knows that no one knows the landscape and knows the plants better than Sylvester Owens. And so they appoint him as the head gardener at Biltmore in Asheville, North Carolina. And a fun fact, I did not know this until I was doing my research, but my mother, one of her best friends, a woman named Cheryl Hunley, I was talking about Sylvester Owens one day and she said, Abra, that's my uncle, that's my grandmother's brother. So a real, real connection to me, my family, my life, and just someone we have to lift his voice and honor him for his exceptional skills as the, as they called him, the Azalea King. Another head gardener is this gentleman that you see here, Mr. Malcolm J. Stubblefield, Sioux City, Iowa's finest, y'all. He is a graduate of, Ohio, of, I was about to say Ohio State, forgive me. He is a graduate of Iowa State University, Iowa State University, and he uh, gets his certificate at the time in agriculture. He makes his way sometime down the road to New York City, and he becomes the gardener at the New York Botanical Garden. And so during the mid-1930s, the beautiful appearance of that garden is credited to him. He also goes on to work in the parks department uh, for the city of New York as well. Um, this is a gentleman whose father loved to grow flowers. And I believe that may be where his interest in horticulture, beautification and floriculture came from. Malcolm Stubblefield leaves New York, goes on to live in Washington, DC, moves in social circles there, is an entrepreneur. He, um, his, his wife becomes friends with Jackie Kennedy. And when President Kennedy is assassinated, his wife is called to the White House to even comfort Mrs. Kennedy. So this is who Malcolm Stubblefield is. He is into the politics. He's a man about town. And he is an exceptional horticultural legend, in my opinion, because New York Botanic Garden is a beautiful, beautiful place and nothing to play games with. Then I want to move on to other people who are certainly exceptional horticulturists, plants women of their time, people like this woman here who is called Aunt Phoebe. And I say that in air quotes and I'll explain why. And this is a woman who is at the Magnolia Plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. And this is one of the, if not the first public garden in the United States of America. And after the Civil War, the Drayton family, to be able to keep the, the land in their family and to hold on to it, they've lost, they've gone from about 2,000 acres pre-Civil War to about 500 post-Civil War. They have to hire back on the people the enslaved people who worked that land hired them back on as tour guides is what they're called, tour guides. And I say that because if you were enslaved and you worked that land and now you're back on that land as a tour guide to work it and you know the plants of that land, you know where all the camellias are, you know where the azaleas fall, you know, if y'all have not been to Magnolia Plantation, it's a swamp. You know everything on that place. You know where the spirea are, the magnolias. You're not a tour guide. You are a plants woman. You are a horticulturist. You care for that land. You understand the identification of the plants. You understand the seasons of the year. So this is a woman that is much more than a tour guide at Magnolia. And when we talk about referencing her as Aunt Phoebe, this is a truth. Y'all recognize this is Hattie McDaniel from Gone with the Wind. And there are a few factors that come into play when we look at the legacy of people like uh, Aunt Phoebe, who I choose to call Miss Phoebe. Number one, this is a dark-skinned Black woman. So yes, colorism comes into play. We just looked at Sylvester Owens, fair-skinned, what we would say light-skinned Black man who can essentially pass for white and is credited as a head gardener and the press picks this up and is okay with it. But when you look at someone like Mrs. Phoebe, dark skin, dressed like Mammy, which was a popular attire at the time for black women in servant roles. And then also referring to her as Aunt Phoebe. Well, she's not our aunt. It's no different than Aunt Jemima. The reason being at the time, older white people in the South or white people in general in the South, again, this is during the Jim Crow era. This is just historical context. 
we're not going to call older black people by honorific titles like Mrs., like Mr. So you see a Uncle Ben, that type of thing. And so that is why she is referred to as Aunt Phoebe, as it should be Mrs. Phoebe. So I just want y'all to understand the context where colorism comes into play, sexism comes into play, racism comes into play when we don't credit people properly for the contribution that they have made to American horticulture and agriculture. Then moving on to the left, this is probably one of the most famous garden photos in America. Um, I'm sure many of y'all have seen it. The legendary Henry Kirkland with the cutest child ever holding this water bucket. And in Missouri, this is the first black man who teaches horticulture at the University of Missouri. And at the time he is not credited as a professor, um, University of Missouri has certainly righted that wrong. This is an award-winning grower. This is a man that pioneered sustainable gardening practices. He brought in a sustainable irrigation system that didn't overuse the water. This is a man that was a, a truck farmer as well, grew vegetables. People knew to go get their food from people like Henry Kirkland. He taught these classes, is an exceptional professor at the school. And in February of this year, the University of Missouri uh, renamed the plant sciences lab as the Henry Kirkland Laboratory as they should have, uh, considering the work that he did for Missouri and for the United States in fruit and vegetable production. Another uh, farmer I wanna talk to y'all about, y'all are master gardeners. I don't know what your jam is. My jam is flowers and trees. I love them and garden history and the art of horticulture. So I got four things I'm super fond of, but as master gardeners, as plant lovers, you can love it all or you can love specific things. So I wanted to give y'all a range today. And this is a couple named Atris and Lottie Stepp of Fayetteville, Iowa. And for over 100 years, this family farmed watermelons and cantaloupe at their farm in Fayetteville, Iowa. And the watermelon festival that happens there to this day is was launched by this couple and also is to honor them. Um, watermelon. Watermelon is one of these um, symbols that when we look at racist tropes in America, you see the dark skinned black image with the big smiling teeth and the watermelon and it's bright and pink and dripping down and juicy and sloppy. And watermelon was once a symbol of freedom for black farmers. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because to grow watermelon, you need land, you need space and you need time. And there were some farmers that lost their land post-Civil War era in the South that really didn't like these new black farmers with land that they own, with space, with time on their hands to grow things like watermelon. It's a big fruit, it's not tomatoes, you need some space for this. And so watermelon was turned into this racist trope where if you were standing around eating it, it, it um, made you sloppy. It's not like an apple that you can just hold. Um, you were lazy because you, you chose a slow plant to grow. It was something that people had to gather around and share. And so I want y'all to understand that sometimes things that are symbols of positive, um, positive things in communities can be turned negative when people are jealous of their success. But thank the Lord that the step uh, farm was there, that they not only survived with the watermelon business, they thrived and also cantaloupes. If you look at the bottom of that picture, you'll see some cantaloupe there. Atris and Lottie step said that for 60 years they were married and they ate cantaloupe every day of those 60 years. And Iowa State University, who is Malcolm Stubblefield's alma mater, as you saw earlier, reached out to them to grow new uh, cantaloupe and watermelon varieties. And they also had beehives. So these folks really, really know what they're doing. And Atra Steps' father, James, is the one that started the watermelon business for them. So when we think of Iowa, we know it's the Midwest, but we don't necessarily think of the black farmers there. And the black farmers there have a long, long history of success. The farm is no longer in the family today. It's been purchased and moved on. However, the, um, the, the piece of art there, the water uh, container you see on your right, that is the marker of the melon farm today. This gentleman is a gentleman named Mr. Charles Dickinson. And again, legacy. So. 
Um, I've said this before. It won't be the last time I've said it, but the saying goes, we ain't new to this. We are true to this. Another legacy. This man's father had a landscaping company, Dickinson and Sons Landscaping, and he was the sons. Now, Charles Dickinson's father was also very active in the NAACP in Ohio. This gentleman is from Ohio, I believe Columbus, Ohio. He goes on to Ohio State University to major in horticulture and landscape architecture and gets his uh, undergrad and PhD from there. He leaves Ohio State, Charles Dickinson, and goes on to teach at Tuskegee and finally ends up at Lincoln University in Missouri. This gentleman is the first black man who was elected a fellow in the American Society of Landscape Architecture. And he was also a very big advocate and proponent for young black men joining this new field called landscape architecture. Because at the time, Charles Dickinson was only one of three to four black landscape architects in the country. So um, it, this is also a gentleman that died fairly young. He was in his late forties or early fifties when he passed away suddenly. So his story may not be as known, yet it is equally as relevant as he was very much um, trying to get more people, specifically young people into the field. And you can see here, he's over here pollinating the Easter lily. I just love this picture, it's just incredible. It really is. Now, I mentioned him what, being one of three to four black landscape architects at the time. And this is the first one you may certainly recognize, Mr. David August Williston the first black man to graduate from Cornell with an agriculture degree. And he goes on to earn his landscape architecture. At the time, it was a pretty much an engineering degree, but what we now know today is landscape architecture from a school in Pennsylvania. This is a man that is handpicked and brought down to Tuskegee by Booker T. Washington um, when he's there. David August Williston works in the agriculture department and teaches horticulture under George Washington Carver, of course, the gentleman who is the head of the agriculture department at Tuskegee. This is a man from uh, North Carolina, from the Outer Banks of, of North Carolina, born into what would, many would consider an elite black family. He had a small garden plot when he was a child. His brother paid his tuition. He went to Howard Normal School and then went to Cornell to finish and then comes back to Tuskegee. Doesn't just work there, he works at Fisk. He works also at, um, it's escaping me right now, but when I can remember the other school, I'll tell you, establishes his own landscape architecture firm in DC, works at Tuskegee for 28 years, is a close friend of George Washington Carver his whole life and moves on. While at Tuskegee, he builds the, or does the landscape design for Booker T. Washington's home. He lays out the landscape of the campus at Howard University, he does the residence for Ralph Bunch, uh, the, the ambassador to the UN, the black man. He also lays out airfields in the South. He lays out the campus of Fisk University. So this is a man that through his 90s was super sharp, super effective, an incredible mathematician and an incredible plantsman, a member. He was a member of New York Botanic Garden. He was a member of the American Forestry Association. So highly in tuned with the environment and one of the best in the business and went on to mentor other landscape architects that came under him, including this gentleman, Mr. Edward Lyons Price. And this, I'm gonna tell you his story, but I also uh, wanna tell you about the things that we lose when we don't educate each other. And that's why we have to speak these people's names and share them. When I went to Auburn, I didn't, go to start out in horticulture. I just went because I wanted to go to Auburn. Decided I was going to be in horticulture. And while I was in horticulture, I said, well, I think I want to be a landscape architect. So I did the summer landscape architecture program. And at the end of that summer, it's an eight-week program, eight to 12 weeks. They only chose 10 or 15 people to be in landscape architecture. I was not chosen. So I stayed in horticulture full-time. Don't feel sorry for me. It turned out beautifully. I love me some horticulture. My point is this. That was around the summer 2000. Edward Lyons Price was still alive then. He didn't pass away till 2007. I could have visited this man in Tuskegee in my lifetime 
talk to him. This is a man that knew David August Williston. This is a man that came to Tuskegee, attended Tuskegee because he wanted to study under George Washington Carver. But because I didn't hear him until the past 10 years, I never got to meet him. So this is why education and sharing is so important. I just lost my earring, but we'll keep talking. So anyway, Edward Lyons Price goes to UCLA. I just mentioned he leaves UCLA because he wants to study under George Washington Carver. He comes there, even though Carver is no longer teaching, he works as a student assistant under him. He earns his um, horticulture degree from, he gets an ag degree from Tuskegee, a hort degree from Ohio State, and his landscape architecture degree, his master's of landscape architecture from UC Berkeley. He also works under David August Williston and stays in Alabama his whole lifetime. This man could have gone anywhere, but he chose to stay at Tuskegee and to live and to work. This gentleman was the second man elected into, uh, second black man elected into the American Society of Landscape Architects. Charles Dickinson was the first. And this is also the black man who was the first registered black landscape architect in the state of Alabama. So Edward Lyons Price is his name. Now, I'm talking about Tuskegee a lot and full disclosure, Tuskegee and Auburn are essentially on the same road. It's 20 miles down the road, make a right, make another right, and you're at Tuskegee. That's how close it is. And I, we cannot discount the influence, regardless of how you feel about Booker T. Washington, which is a whole nother story for a whole nother day. He did create and launch one of the greatest agriculture and horticulture programs that the world has ever seen. And he did it alongside um, his third wife, Mrs. Margaret Murray Washington. And this is a picture of the women at Tuskegee in a class for outdoor work for girls. This is a class that was modeled specifically after the Swanley Horticulture School in Swanley, England. Booker T. Washington goes out to, to England, to the UK, notices these, this all women's horticulture school and how these women are out there learning beautification, learning um, tree placement, learning how to do landscape design and community and decides, I want to do the same thing for the women at Tuskegee. Because at Tuskegee, as a student, you're charged to take the knowledge that you have and go back into the community to share it. This is also during the time that outdoor work for women was not a popular thing. People didn't understand why women should be outside doing this type of work. But Margaret Murray Washington observes the women in the ag school, she chooses the, the popular kids, the cool kids, the you can, you know, the, the ones that are the leaders and says, this is what we're doing. We're doing outdoor beautification work. We're gonna learn um, arboriculture skills and landscape design. And if y'all do it, other women will sign on. And that is exactly what happened. And this is what you see them doing at Tuskegee. And it, right now, honestly, this looks very much like maybe a floriculture project. Um, so, the women at Tuskegee, we have to acknowledge, even though they may not have gone on at the time, like Lyons and Williston, for various reasons to do, be landscape architects, we do have to acknowledge their legacy as designers, these women students who laid out plantings at this campus. And the women whose names we'll never know. I do not know the name of this teacher in this photo. What I do know about this teacher is that, again, back to, to uh, Booker T. Washington, he talked about the influence of nature on his success. This is a man born into slavery, walks to Hampton University, gets into the school, sweeps the floors at night, becomes a star student at Hampton and is handpicked to launch this new university, Tuskegee in Alabama. And what he talks about specifically to the children, he talks about how nature is so influential because it forces you to have this level of self-awareness and observation. And if a man is writing a letter, nothing changes on that letter, uh, writing a letter to your mama, nothing will happen until you come back the next day and finish it. However, with a plant, no matter how small, something will happen to a plant overnight during the day, every hour. And he wanted his students to understand that. And so I think that is very appropriate to include the women, the names, the faces, the people will never see and the influence they had on these children. These children could be learning anything and they are sitting here at their desk, just like we were at Auburn and what, like what y'all do as master gardeners with their pine cones on the desk, studying the parts of a pine. So it is very necessary and very um, 
just efficient and, and, and should be the way that nature is such a huge part of a curriculum. And it is incredible how Tuskegee had the foresight to teach this to the children. And this was the Tuskegee Children's School. So clearly these kids aren't in college. These are normally the children of the professors at Tuskegee and also of the people in this rural black town in Alabama. Moving on. So I talked about Ohio State earlier and Charles Dickinson being a grad there and Edward Lyons Price being a grad there. Now this gentleman here is Mr. Charles William Costello. And what I didn't mention about Edward Lyons Price and David August Williston and so many of these other folks, they were exceptional artists. So you also know this is a gardener, right? You uh, have multiple talents. Charles William Costello was displaying some of his work at a WPA exhibition in Columbus, Ohio, the Work Progress Administration exhibition during the 1940s, during World War II, and one of the Ohio State professors saw his work. This is a man who was a magician, had a whole traveling magician company caravan with employees, and all of that ended up tragically burning to the ground one day. And he used his artistic skills to start drawing. And he loved to draw. And as a child, he observed an insect falling into his drink at a picnic and really became fascinated with insects and drawing. And so he was hired at Ohio State to be an entomological artist, the artist, the person in the department who draws the pictures that the students study in entomology. So I took an entomology course. I'm sure that many of you all have taken that as well. And this is a man that built his own microscopes. He was also an inventor. So he could study every detail of the insects and draw them for the students. And on the right here, you can see this is some of his work. Ohio State still has his work to this day. Thank God they have thousands of his charts. And he also went on to Wilberforce University to do entomological art and also art where you're drawing um, the birds and uh, the other um, type of small animals in the environment. So people like Charles William Costello, the influence that they had in teaching about insects um, to people who were in the fields of horticulture. We know this man needs no introduction, but I'm gonna introduce him anyway. This is of course the one, the only, the greatest of all time, George, Washington Carver. And many of us forget that he was an artist. You just saw Charles William Costello was an artist. Edward Lyons Price was an artist. This is a portrait that he won uh, in the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, George Washington Carver, who initially went to school to study art and was denied that in Kansas because he was black. And so he leaves, goes on to Ohio, Iowa State. I don't know why I keep saying Ohio State when I mean Iowa State. Um, in, in studies agriculture there, the rest that we know is history. He comes down to Tuskegee at the request of Booker T. Washington. So what's important about his artwork? George Washington Carver, regardless of what extension tells you, Booker T. Washington was adamant that the agriculture work be taken out into the community. And so he had, George Washington Carver had an idea and he sketched up what is called the Jessup Agricultural Wagon. Jessup is the white man that funded this wagon. They wanted a mobile agriculture school to go out in the community. This predates extension, y'all. This is the birth of extension. Extension is gonna tell us another story. I was an extension agent for the University of Georgia, so I know the story, but I'm telling you that Tuskegee had an extension service first. It was this Jessup Agricultural Wagon. George Washington Carver drew it out. This is his sketch. This is how great of an artist he was. And he had his protege, Thomas Monroe Campbell, who is the first black extension agent, uh, credited is that once the extension service goes national to take this Jessup wagon out into the community. And here it is, the students at, the at Tuskegee built this wagon and it looks just like the drawing to scale that George Washington Carver did. Now, Thomas Monroe Campbell is a person that took this agriculture out and showed these farmers in Alabama the best farming techniques, the newest practices, um, the latest ways to do things. He also had his own radio show. He had a son that was accepted into Cornell to attend the agriculture uh, program there. And I believe his son died before he even made it to that school. However, this is how vested into food and farming Thomas Monroe Campbell was. He was dedicated to the craft. 
and he was an extension agent, one whose face and name we can never, ever forget. Also want to talk about trees. I told you I was a flower girl and I am a tree hugger. I grew up on two acres of trees in Southwest Atlanta. I love them. And I was a former arborist with the city of Atlanta. This gentleman, Mr. Ralph Elwood Brock, he is the first black man to earn a forestry degree, the first known black man to earn a forestry degree in the United States of America. And at the time he attended the Pennsylvania State Forest Academy, which is now known as Penn State Mont Alto. And he starts as a class of 13, only six make it the whole way through. He is one of the six and he is a star student. He graduates with an average that's 90.4%. I think he's number two in his class. And he ends up leading the nursery there at Penn State Mont Alto once he graduates. They have renamed the nursery at Penn State Mont Alto, the Ralph Elwood Brock Nursery. And there's a marker there today that talks about his life and his story. This man also went on to own his own nursery, have his own landscape company. He worked in New York and was called by Rockefeller, one of the Rockefellers to do the landscape for the Paul Lawrence Dunbar um, housing apartments there. It was a black housing apartment in New York. And his own sister, Mary Brock, was the teacher to Bayard Rustin, a civil rights legend. And she was the one that helped him be this great orator. So the Brock family was nothing to play around with. This man did not have it easy at all. He faced a lot of hardship during his life at the nursery. A lot of people had a hard time having a young black man as their boss. And he eventually ended up leaving the nursery Certainly they're not lost, but Ralph Elwood Brock went on to survive and thrive in many other ways and was a successful forester and the first black man with a forestry degree in the United States. Now I wasn't gonna talk about these brothers without talking about the sisters, okay? This is the first black woman to have a forestry degree in the United States. And her name is Audrey Calhoun, Winifred, Louisiana's finest. She attended Grambling University, and she goes on to Louisiana Tech University to get her master's degree. And she's studying zoology. And a professor comes to her and says, well, what do you think about forestry? She hadn't necessarily thought about it. And the town that she's born in every year, that town has the Louisiana State Forest Festival. There's a whole national forest in this town. So I feel like it was kismet that she ended up being the first black woman with a degree in forestry. She goes on also to work as a student at the National Parks uh, Service, works at Yosemite National Parks. And I believe it's 1973 when she comes out of Louisiana Tech with that degree in forestry. I don't know much more of her career beyond that. I do know, and I'm 99% sure, unlike most of the people you're gonna see on the slide today, this woman is still alive. I have tried to reach out to her unsuccessfully, but I will continue to try because Audrey Calhoun is someone who is a legend in the forest world. And it wasn't that she was just the first black woman to graduate in forestry. She was also, from all accounts, the first black woman to work in forestry in the National Forest Service at Yellowstone. So that's a very, very big deal. Colonel Charles Young. Uh, I mentioned Wilberforce earlier, uh, Wilberforce University where um, Charles William Costello went on to do his entomological drawings. This gentleman, is there's a beautiful story about him. He, he also caught it too, but we're not gonna reduce his life to that. This is a graduate of West Point. This is a man who went out to California and for that summer became the first superintendent in a national park. And he was assigned to the Redwood Forest. He and his crew, who were the legendary Buffalo soldiers, the black regime who protected trees out there in the Redwood Forest when people were trying to cut them down left and right, who he negotiated to protect much of the land that was kind of being poached off by developers. They built streets and roads that are still in existence today, the work of he and his men. This man was one of the best friends of W.B. Du Bois and also of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the uh, African-American poet that I mentioned earlier. So his life, he also was a gentleman who started the band at Wilberforce. This man played multiple instrument, instruments. He was a linguist. He spoke and understood multiple languages. So these plant people, y'all, they not just anybody's. They are out here doing it and doing it big. So Colonel Charles Young, his contribution to trees, what he did 
and his men did in one summer that hadn't been accomplished in years to protect the Redwood Forest out there in uh, Redwood Park in California. And when he passed away, he's buried in Arlington in y'all's neck of the wood. Thousands of people showed up to his funeral. So that is the type of person Colonel Charles Young was. Now we're getting into the home stretch for the last 12 minutes. I'm gonna go on and cut off my alarm now. I'm gonna talk about folks from the DMV. So uh, DC, Maryland and Virginia. I had to say that so out loud to myself so I don't forget. Mr. Wormley Hughes, the head gardener at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. This is a man that laid out the oval flower beds, the, flamed, the famed oval flower beds at Monticello. He is a person that Jefferson's daughter, Ellen, uh, noted that he was always armed with a spade and a hoe. And he is believed to have been taught his gardening from Robert Bailey, the Scottish gardener who came to Monticello and worked there. Now, I have worked on an estate as a gardener. I understand what estate gardeners do. And Thomas Jefferson did a lot of things. And I can tell you, he wasn't out there gardening as much as he says he was. I definitely believe he was recording it and taking notes. However, if you want to look at the man that was in charge of the work, this is him. That was in charge of the crew, this is him. This is Wormley Hughes. And this is a man that also dubbed Thomas Jefferson's grave. Jefferson's family sold off Wormley's family and he had to work and buy them back in slavery. So it's not that Thomas Jefferson was loyal to him, but Thomas Jefferson has certainly taken a large amount of credit for the garden work that he did. And I think that the people at Monticello have done a great job, an excellent job of highlighting the work of the enslaved black people there and their contributions to not just farming, but to ornamental horticulture at Monticello. So some other gardeners in your area, very familiar to you, the women at the Norfolk Botanic Garden. We talked about the WPA, the Work Progress Administration Programs in the 1940s. Many folks are away in World War II and things still have to get done back home and jobs are needed. And so 200 black women and 20 black men are hired in Norfolk, Virginia to break ground in an area because Norfolk is a place where azaleas and camellias and daffodils and rhododendrons can thrive. And these women for two years were given the worst of the worst job in the freezing cold and rain, in the snow, in the summer humidity and mosquitoes. These women cleared a forest essentially by hand with hoes. They hand dug, they removed the dirt by hand. What would be, I think, of the equivalent to 150 truckloads of dirt. And they installed azaleas and rhododendrons and daffodils and camellias, they installed the bones of what we now know as the Norfolk Botanic Garden. And their working conditions were very, very harsh. And I believe the last surviving member of this group passed away uh, within the past few years. I'm, her name is escaping me right now. But just to be clear about the work that they did. And also, there is a monument that Norfolk Botanic Garden has erected in their memory. Breaking Ground is the name of this monument. So. Um, they deserve a presentation all on their own. I'm going to keep it moving in the interest of time, but the Black women who led the work at the Norfolk Botanic Garden in Virginia. Also in Virginia, so I'm back to my flower people, the, the Blanche King Hurstons and the Annie Mae Van Rees, the Black women who were the flower sellers on 6th Street in Richmond, Virginia. And these are women that grew their flowers out on their farms, out in it's either Enrico or Henrico. I don't know. I'm in Georgia, so y'all correct me, forgive me. But they, they grew those flowers out there in Henrico, Enrico County, in Chester County, and brought them into downtown Richmond. People will come through the north and make a special stop in Richmond just to purchase their flowers. They weren't there to come see those Confederate monuments on Monument Avenue. Those folks didn't care. They wanted to see these women. And the sad part about these women, they got too successful for their own good and they were accused of not having a permit. They were accused of harassing the patrons in the street. And so they were eventually pulled from the streets of Richmond. And when they were doing their work, Richmond was considered a flower city. I'm not sure that people consider it that anymore. So this is, this is what was lost. These type of flower farmers, these women who, if you look closely, um, the, the containers here, they had lard cans, they had baskets, whatever they could find to put their flowers in, that's what they did. And they would also use the branches that they found in nature. 
the berries that they found in nature. So when we think of Constance Spry, the work that they did even predated what she did. And that is not to take from the legendary florist Constance Spry. I'm just saying she has some sisters, some brown skinned ones in Virginia that were doing the same work around the same time. So the legendary flower farmers and flower sellers of Richmond, Virginia, who clearly were not harassing people over here looking like glamazons in their beautiful uh, clothing and dresses. They just got too successful. I also wanna talk to y'all about a gentleman named Asa Sims. Now, another one, actually everybody on here could have their own lecture, but we got one hour, we're gonna keep it moving. So Asa Sims was a person who uh, comes to Hampton, was not intending to major, major in floriculture, but he, he majors in horticulture there and leads the greenhouse there and also works in the extension service. Oh, that is the story I will tell about him today. I'm not gonna go down the road about him in the Black Garden Club of Virginia. That's another story for another day. We're gonna talk about his work in extension. And he was specifically interested in beautification work in leading that effort in the state of Virginia. And here is Mr. Asa Sims here. You see him over here on the left-hand side, the arrow is above his head. And we're on Zoom today, y'all. This man brought 3D models around. That's what you see sitting on his table. 3D models of ways to beautify your home, your church, your community. So you talk about somebody that is committed to the craft, another gentleman that was a great artist and wanted to do art, but realized that, hey, I can use flowers as my paint. I don't have to use paint paint. I can paint the world with flowers and with trees and with shrubs and with landscape practices. And that's what he did. He taught classes like this to thousands and thousands of people in Virginia and North Carolina um, during his time. So Asa Sims, the legendary floriculturist, owned his own greenhouse, grew his own flowers, had his own florist business, but most important was a member of the extension service at Hampton University. His colleague, Dr. H. Hamilton Williams. I'm also not gonna talk about his work with the Black Garden Clubs. What I am gonna talk about though, with Dr. H. Hamilton Williams, another legacy, his mama owned a successful florist in Roanoke, which is his hometown. Now, think about H. Hamilton Williams, this gentleman, is the first person that does a deep study of black landscapes in the South. And by the South, I mean Georgia, Virginia, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina. This man did a 10,000 mile survey throughout the South during the Jim Crow era. Can you imagine driving 10,000 miles in my state, in Alabama, next door during that time? God knows what he had to deal with, but he was working on his thesis at Cornell University. So he graduates from Hampton, goes down to North Carolina a and another HBCU, Historically Black College and University, teaches horticulture, then decides he's gonna go to Cornell and get his PhD. And his thesis is on Black Southern landscapes. Now I will say this, he is critical of the Black landscapes, but his observations are acute. He talks about the tires in the landscape. He talks about, he takes pictures of them. He talks about there's hardly any black home without flowers there, how the black people take a tin can or whatever they can find and grow herbs. So he is noting what we know now, black people taking their gardens with them, using all types of different um, vessels for containers, their love of flowers. And I talk about his eye being critical of their landscape because he talks about it in a negative way. But you got to also understand this man is earning a PhD from Cornell. So that's a very Eurocentric view of landscape that he would have. Nevertheless, he did extraordinary work in Virginia, goes out to Los Angeles, does extraordinary beautification work there, and is truly a legend of the DMV area. As is Mrs. Amaza Lee Meredith, who um, was an art, launched the art department at Virginia State University and also was a woman who, I'm gonna show you this picture that was her in her studio. This is Azure South, which is now the alumni um, building at Virginia State University. But what I wanna show you is this, she's known in her lifetime as an interior decorator and an architect, but she also designed a place called Azure North, which is in Sag Harbor, New York, um, a neighborhood, a black home, uh, a vacation neighborhood with homes in it for black people. So why am I telling you all this story? Because that's what landscape architects do. Yes, this woman was an interior decorator 
and she was an interior designer and an architect. But if you look at this plan right here, you can even see the plants. Now this building is famous for it being a modern style and kind of an international flair, but she's got plants on there. So she might not have been what we call a landscape architect officially at the time, but this woman did design work. You don't lay out a whole neighborhood and not lay out the plants as well. And she did this all her own. So amazingly Meredith, we have to include in our family of people that understood and loved and worked with plants. Now, Roland Jefferson, a man that needs no introduction to y'all, a legendary botanist, graduates from Howard, earns his botany degree, can't get work for seven years, and he is finally hired by the National Arboretum, and they hire him to make labels. He learns about the cherry trees in his childhood from his own father who walked him around the Potomac. And in the early 1970s, he realizes that only 4% of the trees planted during the Taft administration that were gifted to the United States from Japan are still alive. And so what does he do? He gets out there and starts propagating. And he is the one that the reason that the progeny of the original cherry trees in Washington, D.C. are still alive today is because of Mr. Roland Jefferson. And he also co-authored this book with William Fusoni on the Japanese flowering cherry trees in DC. Roland Jefferson also is the second person who is still alive today. He lives in Hawaii and is in his 90s. The most famous picture of them all, at least to me, the legendary Black women in DC that sold their plants on the Potomac, uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue. They came in in horses and wagons and brought these plants with them. Now you can call them flower sellers, but if you look close at those pictures, those plants are potted up. They're cut flowers. This is a mobile nursery. So these are nursery women as well. To just call them flower sellers isn't doing them justice. They're doing so, so much more. And it is said that spring didn't arrive until they arrived. So they start showing up in June. Y'all know what time it is. It is time to be out in our beautiful, beautiful garden. So to me, these are the godmothers to the women in Richmond, Virginia. And I had long known about these women. I had never seen a picture of them until another horticulturist, one boy Ippolito sent me this picture, which just blew me away from the Library of Congress. Any of y'all can get it and you should. I have one hanging up in my house. And I wanna say this, these women are compared to the flower sellers in Rome. That's how impactful they were. Look at how they held onto their Africanisms. Their heads are even wrapped in galas. They just look extraordinary and beautiful there as nursery women, plants women, flower sellers, and floriculturists in 1870s Washington, DC. And we're wrapping it up. It's one-on-one. I promise y'all I'll be done in less than two minutes. This, we are in Maryland. I have finally arrived to Maryland. I'm gonna share two special people with y'all. This is Mary Burns, the legendary florist there. This is a woman. Mary Burns is a lady in the, the, the dark black dress in this is one of her customers in this jazzy leopard print coat that I wish I had. Mary Burns started selling flowers as a child, as an eight-year-old, she would gather wild orchids and go sell them to the white people in Baltimore. And so she had her florist on, I believe it was Pennsylvania Avenue in Baltimore for many, many years and had her shop up until her eighties. So this is a woman that started selling flowers at eight and did not stop selling them until her death in her 80s. So we knew she knew what she was talking about. Someone with literally an eight decade career in floriculture in Maryland and Baltimore, Maryland. And finally, we will end with just gentlemen. So we talked about Blanche King Hurston. Let me introduce you to Thomas Queen. Thomas Queen of Annapolis, Maryland. This man was born into slavery. He did gardening duties as a child when he was enslaved and he one day, very much a Pearl Fryer story, somebody throws some geraniums and some other plants into an ash can. So he goes and sees these flowers and decides, I'm gonna take them, I'm gonna nurse them back to health, and I'm gonna propagate them. And he launches his own greenhouse. This is a man that was a state, that was a gardener at the state house in Annapolis, Maryland. So he worked at the governor's mansion, essentially, y'all. This picture is taken in 1920. Thomas Queen is 86 years old and still shipping plants between Annapolis and Baltimore. So again, no Home Depot, no Lowe's, no big box nursery, folks like Thomas Queen coming in, providing plants into the community. And you can even see, hopefully those are some of his beautiful geraniums up there in his greenhouse. 
So I thank you so much for your time. I do apologize for being three minutes over. And I hope that, as I said, the spirit of these people excite you and make you want to celebrate as much as they do me. Thank you so, so much for your time today. I appreciate you all. My name is Abra Lee. You can follow me at Conquer the Soil on social media. And also you have my email address. Thank you so much specifically to Stephanie Ann Pulley for bringing me in to speak to the Master Gardeners here today. I so appreciate you. Awesome. Thanks, Abra. We really appreciate you too. And I have to say of all the presentations that I posted, I think we've got the most positive comments just throughout the presentation for uh, your presentation today. So we really appreciate you being here for us to speak with us too. Um, and I'm happy to go through the Q&A. We have one that came in during the presentation, folks, but if you did have any additional questions that you didn't type into the Q&A box yet, feel free to put them in at this time. Um, so Abra, the question that we got was from one of our attendees who says, as a non-Black person of color, I'm very aware of the importance of the valuable oral histories of our elders who have a lifetime of experiential knowledge and who hold the stories of those who have passed on. Do you have any suggestions for organizations that collect and or curate oral histories related to gardening and agriculture or native trees and plants? I don't have a specific organization I can recommend you to. I am certain that organizations do this. I would say to you, the overwhelming majority of what you saw, I found out through word of mouth from the elders. Now, some I just knew from research. And um, with the oral histories, a lot of times it really is just talking to people and it's knowing their story and um, just asking random questions of random people because everything isn't necessarily put into the books and specifically with black history you're right to the person said the comment it is an oral history for me for my work i just go through archives essentially and i and again i talk to people but if you don't know of one you can also start your own it doesn't have to be overwhelming work for you it can just be you recording stories of people you know in your community so that is that is one route I would tell you. But if someone does know of an organization that helped this person, please share it. I just can't tell you one because I normally work uh, through historical societies and universities and places like that. Absolutely. And I'd just like to note that um, Abra's information about her social media and her website has been on all the slides. So please definitely check out her blog and her social because she shares a lot of great information and updates there as well that you can look into. Um, and my question for you is actually kind of similar. Just um, someone had asked in the chat box if we could put in the names of everyone that we were talking about. And so Jean and I were working on that throughout the presentation. And I have to say, just trying to Google, you know, to find a site where folks could read about these people a little bit more. Sometimes it was very difficult to find information um, on some of these individuals. And so I'm just fascinated by everything that you've managed to compile here and wondered if you could talk a little bit about your process of finding the information on these people who are historically very important and it should not be as hard to find information on <laughs> I just saw. <laughs> yeah, the, the process I use, I'm trying to find this note in my phone. It started in, in the year 2010. And I was wow. um, with, there was a gentleman named Ryan Ganey, Ganey a very famous landscape designer who, who passed away a few years back. And I was at his house with my mom and he encouraged me to know my history. Ryan Ganey is a white man. This is my mentor, one of my mentors. And when he was saying that he was more specifically, I didn't understand at the time, my mom said, no, he means know your history, your garden history, not garden history starting in the hanging gardens of Babylon, like start in Georgia, yeah. start down the street, starting your family. And when my mother said that to me and Ryan said, that's exactly what I mean. It sent me on this path. And my mom said, I'm going to show you something you get home and I'm going to read you the note. And I save it in my cell phone. It says, <laughs> Uncle Simon, my mother. So she's writing down the people I need to study. Then she says, George Washington Carver went to Auburn at night and taught the other race there. And I said, I know I ain't just sit up at Auburn for five and a half years and nobody in that <laughs> horticulture department told me that George Washington Carver was snuck in at night to teach these Auburn professors. But my mother had that in a book in her house. And I don't know the name wow. of the book. I'm actively looking for it now. She has thousands of books in her house. And I said, wait a minute. 
And so then I started this road and the next person I found out about was Wormley Hughes and the Charles William Costello. So my mother, I do need to know, is a retired educator and she was a historian. That was her major. Uh, she's got awesome. four degrees in history. So she was the one that really truly helped me um, and got me on this. And you're right, it's not all on Google and Google isn't even accurate. Some of the pictures on Google are wrong. And yeah. I know because I've, I've seen the real picture of these people in archives. So again, we just have to share, we have to um, create this community. And for me, I'll, I'll say this also, I feel like I've, I'm living in my purpose and I've been chosen as a medium by these people. They feel like my friends now when I'm not even looking for them, new ones, they come to me. So I think it also just is, is being guided by the spirit and letting yourself be allowed to be guided by the spirit. That's awesome. I love when you mentioned that you think about these folks kind of in your daily life every day and that you're thinking about them as part of your family as you've learned more about them. And it just sounds like such a fascinating process that you've done with your organization here. It is. And it's also it is fascinating. It is exciting. And it also can it's emotional. There are moments of yes. rage. You may be reading about something cool Henry Kirkland did. And then you're also also in the same letter, seeing where some black children were blown up by dynamite in their bed because someone wanted the land or someone was hung from a tree. And this is real. So I'm not trying to belittle right. it. I'm saying that it is exciting. And there are also moments I have to walk away and gather myself and come back. But at the end of the day, that's why I said I didn't want to reduce their life to the times they're living in. And right. I wanted to celebrate their accomplishments. And that's what I hope Conquer the Soil is, it should feel like a family. It should feel like a community, their community. It's like, to me, it's like the New York um, Met, the fashion show where all the people are gathered and they're the best of the best. That's how I feel about these folks. If they're all gathered in one place, that's what Conquer the Soil is. <laughs> that's awesome. What other kind of things are you doing through Conquer the Soil other than your presentations? I am also, I work as a consultant through Lord Cultural Resources. So I work for myself and I've been hired to do work with them. So I work, I'm working on projects for the New York Botanic Garden, um, some other horticultural societies. I have been asked, and I will say the university's name when I can confirm it, but, well, when I've signed the contract. We've confirmed sure. it, but I don't say anything <laughs> until I know I'm getting my money. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but in January of 2022, I have a university has reached out to me to teach their grad students Black garden history, uh, their exciting. landscape architecture. It is so exciting because I don't, I know there are garden history courses. I don't know if yes. one has been so hyper specific with Black America and the work that we've done. So mm -hmm. I am super excited about that. And as soon as that is signed, I will come right back to you, Stephanie, and say, tell the world <laughs> this is who it is. Because your audience needs to know this as well. I went to Auburn and majored in horticulture, but I failed out in return. So I was on academic suspension for six months went back and completed my horticulture degree. And that was something that I always felt like, man, am I good enough? So you are good enough. You can be self-taught. You can Absolutely. kill plants. You can get fired from the garden center and still end up being a professor in college. And that is not to devalue education. That's just say, continue to believe in yourself and keep going and keep pushing. And it is never too late. You can start in this industry at any time. Awesome. I love that message and I completely agree. I've definitely unfortunately killed my fair share of plants <laughs> in my experimentations, but you know, sometimes experience is the best teacher. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's a thing. I've lived it, right? I didn't necessarily, right. I would love, <laughs> I would love to get a PhD in this. However, I worked for 20 years. This is my 21st year working in horticulture. So living it also matters. And it does. even with yeah, I went to Auburn. However, I will never be the horticulturist or agrarian that my mother and my grandmother and my great grandfather were and their and my great great grandmother. So I'm not it's not lost on me that I get this title because my parents had the privilege and the financial resources to pay for my education when the people that really deserve it are the people who we will never speak their names. So I want to be very clear on who the real horticulture stars are in my family. And it ain't me. I can tell you that. <laughs> Awesome. I love that. So we didn't have any more questions that came in, but seriously, the chat is just full of 
so many positive comments and folks who have been inspired by everything that you've shared with us today. So I just want to say a big thank you from the Master Gardener program for taking your time to present for us today. So much appreciated. Um, and I'm sure there'll be so many more folks who are watching this recording that couldn't join us live today. So thank you for your expertise. We've already had requests to work with you again. So oh, I'm thank sure you. you'll be hearing again from us in the future. Thank all y'all. Thank you, Terry Spate for coming out. Thank all y'all truly. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm so, so happy and have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful day.